everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. We are talking to Dr. Richard Lane in part three of our segment, and we're talking about um, memory and why that's so important if you wanted to um, change, have enduring change in your life and um, for potential issues. Now, we were talking about, um, uh, we were using the example of uh, specific memories, um, like maybe you have a fear of, of doing public presentations. And so we were using that as a, a hypothetical thing. Um, and then um, I, we were talking about the types of memories that can be reconsolidated. Um, so what types of memories can be changed and how are memories actually erased? Right, so, um, there are three, as we talked about before, there are three major categories of memory that I think are relevant to mm -hmm. um, psychotherapy, the episodic or event memories, mm -hmm. the semantic or schemas or generalizable knowledge, and um, the procedural mm -hmm. or inactive memories. It turns out that um, the easiest one to modify is the episodic or the specific event memory, because it's just really one event, if it makes mm. sense, potentially. Um, the harder to modify are the semantic, and harder still are the procedural. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about changing procedural memories, we want, we're talking about having our automatic behaviors, you know, modified and updated so you don't have to think about it. I think that that's a very, you know, difficult goal to achieve. Mm -hmm. But what, what can be achieved is, you know, if we're thinking about um, the kinds of memories that lead people to have recurrent problems in their daily lives, the schematic memories can be updated. Now, I think um, the important thing to say here is that Memories are encoded in, uh, across different systems in the brain. So any given memory, whether it be episodic or semantic, has uh, elements to it that involve multiple brain systems, like visual information, auditory information, motor behavior, emotions, etc. And what we're especially interested in is the emotional component of these memories. So um, when we talk about how to bring about enduring change in psychotherapy, we think it's important to activate the old memory, often a problematic memory, but also really experience the painful emotion associated with it. Again, because we think that avoidance of those painful emotions is what's causing the problem, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And the second step is to have what we call corrective emotional experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So we use the example of uh, something that happened in your childhood or adolescence, or early adulthood that you never told anybody about. And that's quite common actually. Mm -hmm. And you feel a lot of shame and embarrassment, but let's say you start in psychotherapy and you establish a trusting relationship. You recognize that the therapist really as your best interest at heart is compassionate, non-judgmental, and you share the memory with them. And the, you might expect to be ridiculed or rejected, but the therapist is actually, you know, very caring and compassionate and sympathetic. And that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is counter to expectation. And it's mm -hmm. much more positive than expected. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is we're reworking the memory because we've activated the memory and the associated emotion, and it's now in a labile state, and it's updatable based on new information that comes in, right? That's relevant. And the new information we're saying often involves a psychotherapist mm -hmm. responding in a way that really has an impact on you mm -hmm. emotionally, okay? Okay that actually is updating the memory itself. And then that kind of gets reconsolidated and stored back in your brain after a night of sleep, okay? 
And the idea would be that, that the next time you're in a situation that's relevant to that, that trauma from the past, your expectations about it are a little bit different. You don't feel as much shame. You don't feel the need to avoid as much. You're willing to take chances. You're willing to be open in a new kind of way. To have more experiences of updating to reinforce the new configuration of the memory, if you will. Mm. Okay, so let's say we'll use the example of um, we in, in the previous segment, just to continue the analogy of, um, let's say that you, um, someone doesn't actually like to do, you know, radio interviews are very intimidating. And so or and that has roots to do with like when they were 10 and they did some type of presentation in the class, the teacher said, come on already. Ah, are we done yet? You know, said something really rude. So that child was traumatized. That's right. Told their parent about it. And then now you go to a psychotherapist and they're like, you know, that says something about it to just recast that whole event to like, you know, that, that whatever was, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, you could look at it in this particular way, look at all these wonderful experiences thus far where you've had wonderful radio interview, you know, whatever. So they recast right. it. Okay. But so. then the, the therapist needs to get you to stop avoiding and try um, it out. Okay. Try it out and have a different experience. Get back on the horse, essentially. Uh, okay. And so um, the label state, what does that mean? Labile. What does that even mean? <laughs> it means modifiable. Okay, got it. So you're, you're, right. you're in this state, I'm meeting with the psychotherapist, I'm recounting my awful experience, mm -hmm. presenting my science project at age 10, where the teacher was mean to me. So like the psychotherapist is helping me change all of this. Well, to change certain aspects of it and to update it. Okay. okay. Like, for example, um, you might conclude that you're a horrible person, because that happened, right? And so that's a kind of thought that goes along with the memory. The memory itself of, you know, having had this experience in school and even what the teacher said will, won't be erased, but it's going to be supplemented and updated with this additional information so that it doesn't have the same zing, that it doesn't have the same power on you that it had before. Interesting. Okay. So I get the psychotherapeutic session. I go, you said that one of the important things is sleep on it, right? So I have to, yes. why yes. is sleeping important? And how, how is that in part, how does that all fit in? Yeah, well, what we've discovered is that uh, <clears throat> memory, when memories get formed in the first place and they get consolidated, mm -hmm. that requires a night of sleep. Just think about it. You know, when we're going about our, daily lives, we're taking in all sorts of information, we're responding to situations in the moment. Mm. Then when you're sleeping, all that external stimulation is offline. It doesn't happen anymore, right? It's shut out. And now you have a chance to do some housekeeping and to retain memories and store memories, right? As well as do other kinds of maintenance on the brain that happens when you're sleeping, okay? Mm. So it's just a fact that consolidation and reconsolidation happen during sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, there's evidence that emotional memories in particular get reconsolidated during that phase of sleep called REM, rapid eye movement sleep, mm -hmm. when we have our dreams, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So that becomes really, really interesting. I, you know, Sleep is not something that I have particular expertise in, but as I got involved in this area of memory reconsolidation, there are people who specialize in the role of sleep in memory reconsolidation. And I said, you know, what about taking a nap after a psychotherapy session? You know, ha ha ha, isn't that a funny idea? Mm -hmm. And they said, no, that's not strange at all. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's, a, here's an example of how this perspective changes things so much, okay? Mm, mm -hmm. As a psychotherapist, you know, we see our client, say, for an hour, and they come back a week later. And, you know, a lot can get done in that session. 
and we just think about how we're just going to pick up essentially where we left off. We don't think about what happens. What, what are people going to do over the next few hours right. after the psychotherapy session? Because lo and behold, we've activated these memories and that memory reconsolidation window is open for four to six hours. Okay. <laughs> so, so for example, you know, what, one of the things that we know is that when you get emotionally aroused or physiologically aroused, that is a signal to the body that this is an important memory. Okay. Oh. Okay. So in other words, if you go and do a heavy workout afterwards, that arousal might lead you to encode what happened before in a way that it might not otherwise have happened. Oh, oh my God. So, oh my gosh, wait. So I had this like incredible, stunning pre you know, thing about like, oh, I didn't even realize this has to do with my science teacher. And then I go run for like 10 miles on the treadmill, which is like a pretty pressing psychological thing. So now I've actually encoded this like heavy cycle, you know, like running physiological thing in with my memory that was just healed with. <laughs> and, and it will kind of retroactively over the past couple of hours, it will stamp this as important. <laughs> Okay. okay, but like, wait, was it so am I a actually layering onto it my like, let's say I have a workout, and then I have an argument with my husband. Okay, so I have these like two things, or two things that happen within those four, six hours, wonderful healing session, work out really hard, argument with my husband. So how does this all get consolidated in the brain? I think it's kind of a mess, maybe. Okay, <laughs> uh, which is why we don't think about it, right? Yeah. This is this is what the new perspective offers, and it and it just raised, there there hasn't been research on it yet, but I think you know hopefully people are doing it now or we'll do it soon. What about locking in what happened in a good psychotherapy session mm. say, with a nap afterwards? Yeah, fantastic. And, and is it a, it's a it's a important research question? Do you need to have a dream or not? You know, reconsolidation happens in different phases. REM and non-REM. And so these are really important open questions. Yeah, right? but at least minimally being mindful after your really important session so that you don't pack an overlayer a whole bunch of other stuff onto it. Oh my gosh, this yes. is so mind-blowingly good. <laughs> well, thank you. And I mean, it's just fascinating to consider. So like, why do we have things set up the way we have where you come once a week or, you know, you might come more than once a week or once every two weeks, but why do we do it that way? Well, obviously there are all sorts of reasons. The clinic is set up that way. Your work schedule is set up that way. Third party payers will only pay for once a week or whatever. But if you really wanted to design therapy to optimally work, right? Maybe you'd want to have a corrective experience, take a nap, come back for another session exactly. that day, you know? <laughs> Why not have, you know, right. Which is why those retreats work so fantastically. Yes. Exactly. And, 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 and I, I want to, um, I want to actually talk about that in the next segment. Um, okay. We've been talking to Dr. Lane um, about his book, neuroscience of enduring change implications for psychotherapy. That was just huge insight. Huge insight. Really, really interesting. Um, we will be um, coming back talking a little bit more about emotions and um, about how you can actually do a little bit more, like get the most out of your psychotherapy session. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.